Welcome to Radio Pi, everybody. I'm Nick Durazio from OSI Soft, which is now part of Aviva. Today, our topic is shiny object syndrome and how to avoid its pitfalls. Or to put it another way, your digital twin is only as good as the data behind it. Our guest today has a lot of experience rooting out those pitfalls that come with projects like digital twins and digital transformations. So let me introduce Alan Turner. He's the Advanced Analytics Team Lead at International Paper. Welcome, Alan. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. And also our co-host today is Mariana Sandin. She is the Industry Principal for Forest and Paper Products here at Aviva. Uh, hello, Mariana. Hey, Nick. Hey, Alan. How are you? Great. Pretty good. Great. Thank you so much for joining us, both of you. So International Paper, it's one of the world's leading producers of fiber-based packaging and pulp and paper with 48,000 employees, more than 25,000 customers in 150 country, uh, countries. So what do you do at IP? First of all, the best way to look at this is if we focus on the manufacturing side of International Paper. So that's where I sit. So this, this is the facilities um, the technology group, the infrastructure that supports taking wood chips to paper or recycle to paper. And so I'm a supporting role in that operation. I'm not located at a mill site, but I am part of a global technology team that helps support the mills in terms of cost savings and optimizing. My specific role is in an initiative called Mill of the Future. So this team that we've formed in the Atlanta Tech Square area is focused solely on middle of the future initiatives. And this uh, office that I'm um, broadcasting from today is our innovation center here, and it's called the Advanced Analytics Center. And so that is my role is to ultimately build this team, this office, and support our mills for cost savings measures associated with data and analytics. So Alan, where did you see the opportunities to fix things were? What was the problem that you decided to address? I don't, I don't know if it was a problem per se, but when you're coming into a middle of the future initiative and you start looking at what we want to do, you try to figure out what's going to set you up for success. And so if we really quickly, and I'm sure this is the same in every manufacturing company these days, if you go and you look at the raw data level, and you realize the kind of projects you're, you're going to attach to that data, it's pretty quick and easy to see that they don't line up. So the data and the structures to develop the data may have been around for decades. And when it was put in, it was not put in in such a way that it would foresee, I'm going to attach artificial intelligence. Um, they might not have been able to spell AI you know, in the 1980s, for example. And so there's a disconnect. So if if we want to do those initiatives that require this data, we needed to focus on this data. And I guess um, one of the early ways I envision it to you know my team and the people that I was uh, interviewing with in terms of IP, talking to them and figuring out where things um, existed, is um, I think we could kind of close our eyes and hold our hands out and we could bump into opportunity. That's how rich um, the opportunity is to improve our foundational data is. Right, and if I understand, uh, and, I mean, you, you, it's been measured. You, it's in the billions. Is, is it fair to say it's in the billions, the opportunity for doing things digitally? And is that an IP number? I, I wouldn't say that it's specific an IP number. I know that in terms of our middle of the future, um, when we look at productivity, when we look at uh, cost savings, when we look at even environmental and safety, if you look at all of those ways that coming up with a digital strategy affects it, uh, it's definitely a seven-figure number, uh, probably over a billion, and we're probably not alone. I would think other industries would see similar numbers. It's um, it's actually so big it doesn't matter how much math you put into it. It's pretty significant. Okay, so we we hear the challenge uh, trying to do advanced things with old systems. What was your response to that? What do you see as the solution? There's no real magic solution, unfortunately, and um, I guess the key challenge is to convince the stakeholders that want to accomplish higher technology that we have to go back and fix the foundation or clean up the messy basement is what I always like to say. You know, in many cases, our, 
archives, our data historians uh, are a mess from old tags, stale tags, um, data that no one really knows why this pie point or something was established. There's so much of that there. We have to go and either put a blanket over top and start afresh, or we have to clean it up. So that that would be my answer to that question. Okay. All right. And and I just want to add one thing to that. So we we need to remember that in the industrial world, we come we we come to a point where you had a plant that was probably acquired from another company, right, that had different standards, different kinds of technology, or that has been growing or adding capacity at different points in time in history, right? So there are some paper mills out there that have been running for the last 120 years. And so back then it was really hard to envision what was going to be possible today in all these shiny objects. I like how you said, uh, Nick, digital transformations in plural, because sometimes it feels like that, that there is not just one, but several that you can go after. And and that's that's very hard to plan. It was very hard to plan, right? So when we look at the physical assets, I think that the messiness or the um, unstructured of the data of the operational data that we see today is a reflection of that as well. So, uh, yeah, so true. Now, and those people yeah. who who are familiar with you know, the Pi system, they know that data compression is an important part of data integrity. That can affect this as well, right? right? That's what you noticed, right? I mean, absolutely. It's um, it's things we wouldn't ordinarily really think about on a normal basis. You set it and forget it. You know. Back when you set the tag, you set it. But now we're trying to attach things uh, to the data that might like to see more of it, so less compression. And um, at the time, maybe compression was set up because it was costly for data storage, where now it's extremely cheap and effective. And so, um, you know, convincing stakeholders that, okay, to put in a digital twin, perhaps we need to run a tool or spend some time checking compression or tag naming conventions. And um, I, I really like what you were saying there is the fact that it's almost like um, you, you've bought a house and you're doing something, but when it was built, it's not to anywhere near today's building codes. Right. And so that's that's kind of where it is. You, you built a house that was perfectly fine with your data structure set, your naming convention set, Everybody at the mill knew, uh, and then all of a sudden you're either acquired or change, change companies, um, divest some uh, part of your mill, and now you have a different building code, and you have to match those up somehow. And, mm -hmm. and that's many cases in this day and age with m the number of mills that have changed ownerships in the past decade alone. Uh, it, it's, it's a real challenge, but one we have to get through. You know, you can't be successful until we get everything uh, on the same basis, really. So data remediation, I guess, is what you'd call that. Okay. And that and the cleanup that you're going to do there, I mean, specifically for folks who do have the Pi system, there's one tool that you use for that, right? Can you describe that? Well, there's many tools, um, but probably the biggest piece, and this was, again, when we started, when you mentioned the question earlier about what did I see initially, um, when I came in and um, a colleague of mine, Rick Smith, uh, many people probably know him from from Pi World and his contributions there. Uh, but he showed me this tool called Asset Framework, and you know I'm coming in from the operational side, an engineer, not really that familiar with all the nuts and bolts of of the OSI uh, soft platform. And it took about five minutes for me to realize this this is exactly if I was going to build something as an engineer, and I've got you know scattered um, tools on the floor. I'm going to structure them in some way that I can find them, rename them, and so forth. An asset framework just jumped out as, you know, a perfect fit for the kind of uh, mess we're trying to clean up. And so, for sure, I mean, if we call the Pi database or archive our heartbeat, um, asset framework is going to be right around that in terms of giving it uh, rigidity. Okay. If I understand sometimes... You know, a, a shiny object project with a lot of impetus behind it, I mean, that can actually be a detriment sometimes. Can you describe that? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, think about attaching, you know, artificial intelligence to a platform where you know 
the data is is poor, missing, uh, in error. Um, I think, and and you would see this immediately. Say you went for a walk around and said, and walk up to an operator in a paper machine area, and you said, you know what, we're going to implement artificial intelligence to help you run the mill, and and they maybe they snicker, maybe they don't, but they start talking about some of the data integrity issues that they have. And so the challenge is, yes, we want to, you know, push the limits. We want to try new things. We want to come up with cost savings uh, that has no capital costs. So that's the lovely thing about AI and digital twin. I mean, they're basically man hours and software, but we're attaching it to something that's not prepared for it. And so if you've got a really... Uh, a really eager uh, senior leadership team or something that wants to try something, and then we try something, but we're not on a platform that will support it, then there's a potential that will fail. And then it becomes what happens then? Um, Does the group understand the reason, or is it automatically said, well, AI will never work uh, Mm -hmm. in pulp and paper? And so that's really the challenge, especially in a legacy industry like pulp and paper where you know mills may not be set up for the mill of the future you know they have a lot of possibly a lot of work to get there and so the challenge is twofold one is how do you prepare yourself for potential failure but then you really need to be specific as to where you try certain things uh, because of the data the foundational data quality in certain mills you know it's very interesting what what you are saying because it's a twofold. So one is how well prepared the organization is to adopt this new technology, especially AI. And two, how how good is the data that is going to feed this new technology? And because of my role, I work with other customers around the world. And, and I do see that there are some that are really eager to get it done, get it right, but they are just putting in automation. And like, mm. well, you, you'll get there, right? It's good that you have that. Right. You'll get there. You're not quite there yet. And then we have customers, seasoned customers in data technology, like international paper, that the organization is it's changing. It's a cultural change. And but then there there is some groundwork that needs to be done for these things to work. So, yeah, it's it's not only technology. Definitely a cultural change needs to happen. And that's why you have to be very selective where you try proof of concept uh, projects. You can't just pick one and go with it. You have to be really have a lot of forethought. Okay. There are some things that you were able to do to kind of get more buy-in this time around. Can you describe that process? Well, you know, I'm, I, I, I read a lot. So one of the books that I read uh, a couple of years ago uh, was really – really eye-opening in one part they were talking about how lockheed uh, had the skunk works division set up right and so you know kelly johnson leading that had this mantra of show me right so instead of arguing whether something was worth doing or not okay show me prove it to me you know and so i had that same kind of mantra so let's let's do something let's show people what could be done and in another case, in a, a number of cases, that's what we've done uh, with this team. This, thankfully, strategically focused on these type of initiatives. So we've got a group that can build some prototypes and show a subject matter expert or a mill engineer what could be done. And um, you know, kind of like Wizard of Oz, don't look behind the curtain because there's duct tape and tinker toys and and string. But on the outside, it shows them what could be done. And I think this is going to happen once you can show someone something tangible that they could use and see how useful it is. Then you start to get, gain that in, engagement um, from the people that might be avoiding this whole transformation in the first place. So what were you able to show them this time, you know, initially that got so much attention? Um, uh, probably the best example is really um, just over a year ago, our, our team was traveling with a group of subject matter experts to audit a mill. And um, before we left, we talk, talked about, you know, keep your eyes and ears open for pain points. Uh, look for things that these subject matter experts are doing routinely uh, that may not be adding value, that is just grunt 
work because that's a source of automation. And so we just happened to be along uh, at, at one of those audits um, and kind of saddled up to one of the subject matter experts working on an area process report. And so this report was done every 30 days. My guess is a lot of people listening to this will have, this will probably um, really touch their hearts a little bit. But so this uh, subject matter expert every month was responsible for issuing an enterprise audit report by, by email, several pages long, um, tables and word, and it was uh, taking one area of the mill and evaluating each one of our mills. And, and so this was all done manually pretty much for the most part. So um, multiple Pi servers they would have to connect to, uh, 40 plus spreadsheets for each mill, each line, each species of pulp, uh, connecting to those multiple Pi servers. I think it was maybe 16 Pi servers. And so all of this was done on, say, the first day of a month for the previous 30. And then after doing all of that, sorting, cleaning, filtering, and doing tables in Excel, there's a copy and paste into a Word document that's turned into a PDF that's copied to an email that's distributed. And so to me, this was ripe for automation. And so that, that's really the business case that we selected. Okay, so there's two things specifically that I want to talk about, two uh, initiatives that I wanted to talk about that you had put in that had a lot of success. One was process health diagnostics. The other was advanced mm -hmm. pattern recognition. Let's start about the first one. Um, can you just describe that? What was your process health diagnostics uh, initiative? Yeah, I mean, it fits perfectly with the example I just gave. So, you know, if we really want to give uh, some kind of evaluation of how a, a process in one of our mills is behaving, you need to audit, right? And um, subject matter experts are paid to do this. And so if we could take this routine of manual work that we just outlined uh, earlier with the spreadsheets and the pie servers and the Word document and copy into an email and so forth, if we were able to utilize the asset framework, so if we go back to what we said earlier, and we've got this flat database of pi tags at every one of our mills, and each mill has a different name and possibly a different unit, if we use Asset Framework to add that structure where we can get it in this, the right naming convention, make sure all the mills have the same units, do the calculations that the subject matter expert was doing on our laptop, for example, in Asset Framework in the same way that she approves and, and write that data into Pi from there. That allows us, one, to standardize, two, to remove the data transfer into Excel, which was taking quite a bit of time. And then the whole data conditioning can be done in asset framework or possibly some uh, attached. So with that one, if you really look at just these foundational tools that we own uh, as an uh, enterprise agreement, we, ha we own these tools, we can use these tools. And so if we think about that, we're using the Pi database, we're using asset framework for our structure, and then we're using the Pi integrator for business analytics. And from there, we can utilize those calculations, that data, either in our own report or send it to a third party, such as uh, AI or digital twin. And so, for me, that was a perfect case, and we just kind of wrapped up that prototype, that show me stage, where we said, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna show you how we can make this monthly area report in Power BI that updates automatically every week." So now the mills, instead of waiting for the end of the month, they can now go in and see kind of how their performance is doing ahead of time, which is where we want to be. We don't want to wait 30 days to to make a change. Okay. And there's another initiative that involved advanced pattern recognition and third parties that were grabbing your data, your vibration data, whatnot. Can you explain that? Well, I mean, we can talk even general. I think, mm -hmm. you know, what I keep having to remind myself and others is that if you look five to 10 years from now, we're, we are going as an industry, we are going to have, whether we like it or not, more wireless sensors added to our facilities than not. And so 
we have to be prepared for um, what are we going to do with that data. And uh, you know, vendors in that realm, you know, a lot of them like to sell the sensors, but the the game is for the service. So taking that data from the sensor, uh, promoting that it's wireless and maybe even has a cell connection, and we're going to take that data in the cloud and give you insight back. And, and that's a great short-term um, concept. Long-term, as an owner of the data for the asset, I would like to have that data, the raw data even, not the condition data. And so the challenge is how do you get that data into Pi? Because it's a totally different route uh, mm -hmm. for the data. And so, and that's what we've seen in a number of initiatives. One is the, the one you mentioned, um, where we have, say, a vibration signal um, and, and then it gets conditioned and, and gets um, manipulated, analyzed, and put back in some way, shape, or form. Um, and we have to require, as a user, if we really want to get big data, we have to require that be put back into our data lake or data warehouse, which we call Pi. And so that's really a challenge. And one, you know, people may underestimate how you get that data back, um, how you keep the time series nature to it, that it's the right time stamp from when it was taken and conditioned and put back. Um, how do you, one of the issues we're dealing with now is how do you deal with bad quality? You know, um, how do we set the attribute in the pie tag that it's good or not? Um, some vendors do it, others may not. And so, it's just opened our eyes that this is an area where we're going to have to develop some standards as a company on how we deal with this because it's it's only become it's only going to become more popular to have these type of services and, and sensors. And I mean, and the um, the end result of all this is there's some things that you can bring to the attention of system these subject matter experts. You know, you you're using some AI software, um, but but it. It's not going to do you any good unless you can bring, the, you know, close the loop and bring it back into Pi so that people can see these recommendations that are coming from these advanced systems. Is that is that the end result of all this? Um, I guess the way I, I think of it is uh, at this point, we can't, I don't think we can um, handle the potential loss of value by saying that data adds no value. Or what, another way to put it, uh, at some point you could have said years ago that the cost of storing that data outweighs the, its usefulness. At this point, it's it, the cost is so minimal, and you don't know the future potential of a data point. I'm not sure you can really adequately decide to throw away data. And so for sure, every bit of data we can get, we want to keep. Uh, and so we have to get it back in some way, shape, or form. If it leads, leaves, goes to a cloud, uh, we either need it before it goes or need it when it comes back. And because it's time-sensitive data that I'm talking about in the manufacturing world, it's got to be the proper timestamp. Uh, because all of these AI algorithms and statistical formulas, uh, they'll take all of that data and decide and tell you which one's important or not. Uh, we as humans, I think, will have a challenge determining that. Um, but you don't know what insight you get until you combine SAP data and operating data and prophecy data and the weather channels data and, you know, the local sports. You don't know what you're going to get until you combine them. But if you decide up front you don't need it, then you'll never know. Uh, so you're You're mentioning something that I think it's very important how the subject matter experts today are able to, you know, get their, all these sources of information. And because of their experience, they are able to take some actions, some informed decisions, because they've been in the industry 25, 35 years, maybe more. And, and the fact that we're using today digital technologies to create data models that can give us some of those recommendations what I've seen is because this expertise is starting to go out from the mills um, due to retirement. Some, sometimes there is not the same pool of talent 
to come into the mail. That's that's the other side of the coin too. So do you think that's also, it's not only that it is possible, technology is it's possible today, but do you think that's also another factor why we are going this route? I think it's a challenge from change man management perspective. Um, I think uh, we'd be crazy if we didn't think, okay, this technology, I know it work because it's just algorithms and computer software and stuff. It It's not emotional. You know, if we give it the data, it's going to give an answer. It's the change, the people side, that is going to be, in many cases, whether something is successful or not. So, I mean, perfect example, our, our mills and probably every industry is the same, but our mills are filled with 30-year um, international paper employees. And they don't need data analytics. They don't need advanced sensors. You know, I don't know how many meetings I've been in where we've tried to communicate an initiative of what we're going to do here from Atlanta. And I'll come up to you after the meeting, you know, this is, this is really good stuff, but we tried this in the 80s. It didn't work. And to be quite honest, I don't really need all that, you know. And so, but that's precisely the challenge. You have to say in a nice way, you know, I, I get it. You know, you, you've been a long employee. You're great. You're an A-plus contributor. But it's not about you. You know, this whole initiative is not about you, the 30-year employee. It's about the person behind you um, coming in that's young because you're going to retire. So, And that's truly one of the biggest in, insights from doing digital transformation is setting up the younger generations because of that, that experience gap. Right. Um, and so – it has to be done because we want ultimately, I guess, the tagline here in Atlanta is, you know, increasing the speed of transforming data to insight. Right. Mm -hmm. So the younger generations have this advantage that they've got things at their fingertip that can take masses, massive amount of data and get to insight pretty quickly. And so, yeah, I could have used a 30 year experienced person to tell me which pump to work on. But with this software package, um, I can get them down to five pumps in a, in a series of 20,000 to go work on, and that's a much better odd to get a, a newly hired engineer down to five, and then they can use their, their training and talent to pick which one of the five is the right one. Um, and so it, it's an interesting challenge we face, um, and a really good time for computing power to be as cheap as it is. Right. Okay. It's a fascinating story because what you're talking about is basically get the foundations right and let's not fo let's not focus on the shiny objects. And um, yeah. but it's a good it's a great lesson, I think, for everybody. But anything that you yeah. want to add? Yeah, I would. I mean, I think this was in, in my presentation from from last year. But um, I love Michael Jordan's quote where he says, you know, get the fundamentals down and the level of everything else you do will rise. And that's exactly what you're saying. I mean, if we can <laughs> – and maybe it's AI and digital twin that gives us the motivation. It gives us the relational currency to work on these foundational tools that every person in IT knows we should have been doing 10 years ago. But now we can say, okay, we're going to do AI, but let's work on data compression and data quality and naming conventions. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing that. We're, we're able to get some of these projects that people in IT have said, we were trying to do that 10 years ago, um, but now it has value. Now it has a return because we want to try these other things. And so that's what I would leave is that it doesn't sound very exciting to say I'm working on compression or pi tag naming, but uh, the results of doing it will pay off for sure. So I, I can't say it any simpler than that. Right. And, and, and we do have the numbers of how much it actually pays off from, um, from other stories, from other customers in the industry out there. There was one presentation last year as well that they said by having the right naming convention, we were able to decrease in 50% the, the amount of time that we actually uh, spend building a, a new plan that this is for a um, specialty cellulose product. Mm. And, you know, and it's stories like that, it's when, it's when it becomes relevant or, or it becomes tangible, how yeah. the foundational work is so important. Yeah. 
Well, yep. thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time. Hey, as we as we normally like to do at these, I got a quick set of lightning round questions for you. First one, mm -hmm. uh, what's the uh, what's the, the the most advanced uh, uh, thing, either packaging or paper or whatever, in your opinion, that IP creates? Most advanced thing. Yeah, I mean, for example, when I used to work at DuPont, we used to make this uh, lubricating oil. It would go on to like satellites and stuff. It was $5,000 for a five gallon drum. So it was like, wow, that's pretty cool stuff, right? What? How about IP? Anything come to the top I, of I don't your know head? How, how it, I think it's advanced in my opinion, but um, you know, if you're into the tech world, this is not going to be that advanced. But uh, when we were putting together this office, I, I, just, I toured our design studio for Container Board in Memphis, this uh, consumer product um, facing group. And I was just blown away that this product we're making in some of our mills, how much design goes into making boxes and so forth. And so I walked through there and got to see um, the CAD and the 3D design and laser cut boards just to make like an avocado box that you might see in a Costco or a Sam's. Um, there's a tremendous amount of engineering in there. So when next time you walk by and you see those boxes that have the stacking capability like pallets and the handles and they're rugged and you know you could probably pull your car up on top of those though that is pretty advanced in my mind when you think about it, it just comes from wood fiber oh cool and now i forgot to ask you are you an engineer by by degree and training i am chemical okay. engineer with okay. a open paper degree actually and you're you you found management roles what would your be, advice be to people who are in engineering who want to go into management mm. uh i would think uh, i would just say um the biggest challenge or the thing to keep in mind is that you might have to do less and think more. And so a lot of engineers uh, have something they're really, really, really good at. And so once you get into that leadership role, you may have to do a lot of soul searching to get rid of that thing that you're really, really good at. Because okay. when we're stressed, we tend to focus on the things we're good at and not the things we should be doing. Okay. Well, since you are an engineer, do you have a memento like a broken piece of gear or a fried motherboard or something that you keep in your office just for just for, you know, old time's sake? Mm, I've got the old compact version of the Palm Pilot. Um, <laughs> I bet that thing would actually boot up. Um, I'm trying to think that I would think that's probably it. I like to keep my old Nokia phones because uh, okay. I remember that and actually probably my most um, treasured thing was when I got the Blackberry and could type emails on that little keyboard. So I keep those and, you know, one day okay. maybe they'll make it. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with Cracker Barrel old country stores, but I kind of mm -hmm. joke with people about, you know, things that are old and mean things. I mean, one day there'll be a Blackberry hanging from the old country <laughs> store. <laughs> There's probably one already. Yeah. Okay, so are you are you downtown or are you at a production site? Where are you? I mean, when you're when it's not during the pandemic, where where are you normally located? Yes, yeah, so I'm broadcasting from uh, really our brand new uh, innovation center in Tech Square in in Atlanta. So we're right on the east side of Georgia Tech's campus. Okay. Uh, so I'm I am not at a manufacturing uh, facility, but one of the nice things about being here is within a two to three to four hour drive, we can be at a number of our facilities. Okay, so I got to ask you this because this is something nobody outside of operations has an appreciation for. In all the operating areas you've been in, what's the coolest view you've ever seen? Because I remember I I. I was at a sodium plant once. It looked like something out of Dante's Inferno. It was incredible. How about you? I would say probably the most breathtaking view I've ever had. If you could say that with pulp and paper, this is an interesting <laughs> discussion. Um, but in, in Brazil, uh, I went to, at the time, it was the world's largest uh, single line production facility. Um, and uh, so I went to the top of the continuous digester in that facility. And the continuous digesters are normally one of the taller vessels um, when you look at a pulp mill. And mm -hmm. the interesting thing about that mill in Brazil is that when you go to the top of the digester, not only is it alone, so you're on a very tall, it almost looks like a rocket um, when, you, when you drive up to the mill. Mm -hmm. So you're at the very top. But in Brazil, when you look around, because these facilities are, are normally in forest with clone trees, you 
pretty much can see all of the mill's feedstock in a circle around the mill. And you could see the eucalyptus trees in various stages of of growth. And to me, that was that was pretty interesting to see. That's very cool. That's very cool. OK, cool. So one last question. So you're invited mm -hmm. to to speak to a school, uh, to the to school kids about uh, career day. What do you tell them that you do for a living? Uh, first of all, um, with with the generations that we are now, they 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 want to know about the environment. I think. Um, and so the first thing I would tell, even when I'm recruiting younger engineers from Georgia Tech or NC State or other campuses, you know, the fact that this industry has and always will be a renewable industry, we just did a lousy job of marketing it back in the 70s, 80s, and, and 90s. Uh, but we're a renewable product, very balanced in terms of our chemical use. Uh, we drive a lot of energy from our plants, so it is. We are sending green power to the grid, um, and you know it's it's a renewable product. Um, everything we make can be recycled. We're one of the biggest uh, recycle consumers uh, and and producers in the world. So it just to me, when you tell them that, and you speak to someone who likes to solve problems, which is an engineer by trade, um, it just seems to fit really well. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much, Alan, for uh, for presenting today. We've been talking to Alan Turner, Advanced Analytics Team Lead at International Paper. Thank you so much, Alan. My pleasure. It was great to be here. Great. And Mariana, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Alan. Great, great talking to you. Great. Hey, now, if you want to follow up on this or learn any more, uh, you can go to the URL that you see on your screen right now. This is uh, just basically a, a white paper called The Paper Mill of the Future. Take a look at that. And there's some other things there as well to tell you more about uh, what, uh, what people are doing with sensor-based data in pulp and paper. So, excuse me, in forced products. Uh, so um, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And we will see you in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye.